Okay, welcome back. Talk about exploring choices together. So this won't be true for all of you, but I'm going to imagine that there are some handful of congregations here that might like to conduct an exploration that at least at the beginning stage includes all the choices that I've listed and maybe some more that you've learned about from around your region. Um, and how would you mentally prepare for that? Um, and then, you know, what might be some steps you would go through in structuring such a process and uh, conducting it uh, when you hit one of these choice points? Uh, and that you don't want to just go to one choice that we've been discussing, but might want to actually step back and look again at a list, or maybe for the first time, at a wider list and have some dialogue about, well, why would we do one thing or another? And again, what's our current purpose, mission as a congregation? What is really the work God has set for us today? Um, so it's very important that this be conducted in a sort of atmosphere of realism. Um, you know, how did we get to this juncture anyway? and in graceful ways trying to tell the truth about that. Uh, as I mentioned this morning, the decline often started a very long time ago. The larger culture does not support traditional church participation in membership, and if that's true in the US, it's true with a vengeance in Canada, <laughs> I, I'm hearing. Um, a Christian is popularly associated either with Catholic or strongly evangelical expressions. Survival is our gift if you've been in the decline for a long time, and it's a very good gift, especially for communities themselves that are in their survival mode. And you may be the last remaining institution, public institution that is in your town uh, in some cases, at least that's true some places in the states where schools have consolidated and so forth. Um, so our gift is to keep doing what we do uh, and to kind of notice, hmm, that's what we're good at. That's not gonna, we're gonna, not gonna turn ourselves inside out overnight and become something else. Um, and the people who might be your bold champions of change might be those seven people who are able to lead something really new, may have left in frustration or never really got involved because they got that surviving was what you were good at and valued. Um, and again, to try to raise some of this without too much judgment about it, you know, it's, it's just, just being honest about where we're at. Another piece of realism is who's going to influence the decisions? And I've had a couple of very fruitful conversations already with people about this question. In my experience of church, and it you know, may not be true where you are, but we really don't like to talk about power and influence when it comes to like us and who's using what kind of power right now in this conversation uh, to promote or shut down a certain conversation or whatever it is, um, to select or deselect a particular ministerial candidate. I mean, you can, you can go down the list, decide whether or not we're going to change over to compostable dinner service stuff. You know. Uh, and in my experience, saying that somebody has influence or power can seem like an accusation. People generally, if, they're, if someone points that out or mentions, well, you're a very influential person, they'll usually say, no, no. Because I, I think it's kind of in the water that that would be an accusation. That would be a bad thing. Um, and in fact, it is sometimes used as a weapon, and in dialogue this morning, I became aware of situations in which I've used it as a weapon, if um, that power and influence is being exercised to stop something that I wanted to have happen. You know, if they're in the way of my project, then that power and influence is a bad thing. <laughs> when in fact, it just may be legitimate resistance that just tells me whatever I thought everybody was ready for, there's more work to do. It may be reframing the project. It may be looping back to bring on board people who haven't really been part of the dialogue or 
who had objections they weren't quite expressing, but now we need to hear them. Um, and so I think it's really important to treat influence as a gift. Like any other gift, it can be misused. Intelligence is a gift. Intelligence can be misused to put somebody down, to talk over their head on purpose, to make them feel silly. You know, all, all those things. It's true of every single gift. Empathy can be a gift, can be a, a misused gift, uh, and, and so on down the line. So it's important to treat influence as a gift and to ask how that gift could help our congregation make good choices. A given person may or may not be willing to turn that gift to the work of making good choices. As a leader, you can do your best to accept what they're offering, even if they're offering it in kind of an ugly way, which does happen. Mm -hmm. um, but you can take it in as information. And you can do your best with integrity to take on board. The, there's somewhere under there, there's probably a legitimate question or concern. Um, and maybe to convey to them that you're, you're grateful that that was raised. That, you know, we could have gone off not really ready if we hadn't really grappled with that. So you can be gracious about it, even if the other person isn't. So uh, to be able to do that, to be able to treat influence as a gift, um, at least leaders who are able to do this with some discretion so they don't scare people to death with the conversation, um, begin to really, you know, kind of name names in your own mind and to understand who, what individuals are influential and what is the source of that influence. The first one is reputation. And these are people who, who really are broadly respected. Um, in that multi-cell thing, they may be people who are respected in multiple cells not just inside their, their own circle, their own social or uh, sociological circle. Sometimes it's a, it's a long-serving member who has demonstrated a willingness to act for the good of the congregation and is seen as uh, fair-minded, um, committed, caring, um, in a spiritually healthy congregation, they, they are usually people seen as having a, a, a mature faith that knows how not to impose, impose it on others, but knows how to express that faith in their own ways, verbally or not, um, in their life. The second is coalition building. So these are the formal and informal leaders of subgroups within the congregation or served a congregation in which there was definitely a person in the choir who was the delegate of the choir to any important conversation about what was going to happen. She was going to convey the choir's perspective on this matter, and, and probably mostly really accurately, um, or else she probably wouldn't have been empowered in that role. There are occasionally people who appoint themselves, and even though they're not really supported by all the group, the group will not challenge their assertion, and so they end up representing, but not well, their constituency. And that's really a problem, because you're, you're actually not getting the straight story. The one good thing about the representative is that you can be getting really important information about the viewpoint of that group. Um, if they're not an accurate reporter, then it, it gets very complicated. You might have to find another informant in that group. <laughs> even if they're not visibly influential. And then the third source is communication. Um, information is power is one of those cliches that is certainly true, um, at least in the hands of somebody who knows how to wield it, information is power. Um, and so you think about who calls whom when something has happened, when there's news to share, when the uh, Sunday school room flooded, or um, the minister had to go to the hospital this afternoon. Um, 
for herself or himself uh, to get something checked out, Pal palpitations, whatever, whatever. Or those people that came back from the conference are talking about ending. Who, who, who's going to get that around? And people who are around the church building a lot often have a lot of information. I, I oh lordy, I remember the day as a young assistant, uh, immature humanly and ministerially, <clears throat> uh, and who went to college in the 60s, and uh, out in the, hall, in the parish hall, people were folding programs for Sunday morning, and um, I'm in my office and across the hall are the secretaries and the senior minister. And I don't know what it was that happened that caught me by unhappy surprise, and I let the F word fly out of my office. <laughs> that was big news, and there were many ears. There were many ears. And I, I in another congregational situation, I remember um, being hospitalized for some surgery, and I was being a little vague about the surgery in a very small church, and I, I had been to board meetings where there would be a report on the urinary output of the person who was in the hospital. <laughs> there was an EMT on the, you know, oh, gosh, gosh. So, it, you know, I must say, as I was and I'm going to be in the hospital, oh, great. Um, and, uh, I mean, one woman who, one of these information people. She came in, she planted herself down in the chair, and she said, so what did you have done? And I didn't understand enough about boundaries to say, why is that important to you, Gretchen? Can, can you tell me why, why, why you need that? It's kind of personal information, and uh, I, I need to know if you have a reason why, why it's important for you as a leader to know that. Um, you know, if you're, are you needing to know if I'm coming back? Is it, you know, I'm, I'm going to be fine. Everything, you know, went, went fine. Um, I, I did not have the courage or the aware, self-awareness to do that. Um, and then finally, um, official position. People who are in some elected or appointed role where they are supposed to be making decisions or exercising authority in, in some way. It's really important at any given moment that you understand what the alignment is between the formal authority in the congregation and these uh, other sources of influence. Um, and if they're poorly aligned, uh, a possible goal would be to work over time to get them better aligned. Um, that just makes the system healthier uh, when you do that. Okay, um, I'm now going to talk about some best practices in uh, assessing options. If you're going to be in a situation of looking at more than one possibility, and again, you might be using the video, you might be using regional resource people, you might be uh, calling on a colleague who's here who might be willing to visit your congregation and do some of this so that it can come from an outside voice and people can object with impunity and then that person goes away, they don't have to live with that person anymore. <laughs> um, it can be helpful. So one best practice is to start this assessment before the crisis hits. Um, high anxiety shuts us down, so people who are in emergency behavior are not going to have much of an inbox, that's just the way we are. So start it early. And even by being here, you've kind of started it early by being willing to consider some of this material. It helps to create a structured period of study that includes all the options. And that may need some boundary setting around it. Again, an external facilitator, an external communicator, the video or otherwise. Um, because uh, it's a rare congregation that would have no resistance to looking at everything on the list. It, it can feel threatening. Um, in a, the period of study, I believe there needs to be a guarantee by the informal and formal leadership 
that there will be no decisions made during the study period. Even if there's a groundswell of enthusiasm or a groundswell of objection in the course of studying, that is not a decision. It's a response. And until we get to the end and have a chance to respond to all the parts, uh, we're not finished. And you know, so no decisions. That's sometimes very difficult to maintain that boundary. And so you should expect pressure to short circuit the process, um, to rule out a selected, uh, a particular option or to select it. And so those of you who have studied Edwin Friedman or um, Ronald Heifetz situation, uh, um, adaptive, uh, uh, technical and adaptive change and so forth, stay steady. Stay steady, that's crucial. And engage everyone, even if they won't show up for the study program. Remember what I said about relational? Um, the people who are really going to influence this decision may not be in the room where you show the video the first time, or uh, discuss the material, or have a special program you hold. Uh, and you need to have your list of influencers somewhere, not, you know, you know broadcast this, um, but you need to check off who's hearing it and who's not, and who is contributing and who's not. And so if Henry's, I'm going to pretend you're Henry, Henry's sitting back there and you, know, you see him taking all this in and there's been lively discussion and Henry has not said word one, you might want to inquire. You know, you've been an important part of this congregation, Henry. How, how's this playing for you? What, what are you seeing here? Henry may be a little shocked to be noticed and called out and to have his, inf you don't have to say because you're influential. Uh, he'll, he'll have to then spend time denying that. You know? But um, uh, you, you want to invite Henry to share it here, inst not instead of, he'll still do the telephone but to bring more of it into the public conversation so that it can be part of a public process. And that, I mean, if people legitimately won't do something that Henry disagrees with, okay, for whatever reason, uh, good, good, bad, or indifferent, that, that's their right to respect the voices or fear the voices, whichever, that, that they're gonna. But it's healthier if that's out here where we can see it. And we realized, no, they, you know, we're not ready for that, okay? Uh, one of the things, it took me 15 years of ministry to learn this, is uh, uh, it, uh, imagining leaders of a congregation saying to me, what part of no didn't you get? <laughs> Even though we were saying, yes, we'll do that. <laughs> And I think, well, they said yes. Well, the board passed it. Not so much. So one of my messages to myself for many years has been, what part of no didn't you hear, Alice? Did you think somehow that was all going to disappear? Not so much. So a sample process might look like these five steps. Um, and handout D is a much more elaborate version of this that's like too much information for Saturday afternoon. Is it Saturday? Yes. <laughs> too much information for Saturday afternoon. But it, it, it gives you some more tips and suggestions about each of these. But basically, creating a discernment team, uh, maybe four to six people, and you do want a mix of uh, people whose voice is going to be listened to, and people with some process skills. Because part of the work of this team is going to be to frame a process and present that and get that process adopted um, so that people know in advance what it's going to be. They know there's not going to be any decisions until earlier than X date, you know, whatever it is. Um, so you need influencers and you need process skills um, on that group. 
Um, the second key step is communicating the why before you go to all the options. And even though it may seem uh, just crystal clear that you know the congregation is at a choice point, we can't keep doing this, or you know we can only do this for. Uh, I, I worked with one congregation where I assigned the treasurer the task of calculating, you know, based on their current spending and their current assets, what month were they going to run out of money? And to tell me exactly on the calendar, what, what year and what month will they run out of money? There is an answer to that question, if you, you know, sort of project out current trends. Uh, even those are sometimes too optimistic, but suppose we did. You know, here's where we're going to end if we keep doing what we're doing. Um, you know, sometimes people will work with me on that, sometimes they won't. But it, it's that kind of preparation for the why. And that information needs to come from influential voices. So if the treasurer has prepared that, but the treasurer is not one of the influencers, key influencers, you need to get that treasurer sitting with Henry and sitting with a couple of the ladies' guild people um, who are going to be talking it up everywhere and so on to say, I, would, I, I need some of you to help me look at this information together. And, you know, does it look right to you? Do you have any, you know, do you want to hear how the treasurer came to this? And, you know, does it sound wrong? Does it sound right? What do you think? And, uh, you know, in a, in a contained setting where you can kind of have some hope of kind of managing, managing the reactions a little bit. Um, but the idea is, especially the more challenging the information is, the more you need to start small and work your way out with influencers. And you really want the, the communicators uh, included in that. You don't want just them, but you want them included in that so that in all the informal grapeviney stuff, we can hear, you know, when somebody says, well, how did the treasurer come up with that? The person can say, well, we were with the treasurer. And, you know, she explained, you know, how she went through this. And, you know, if you want to sit down with the material and double check it, that'd be fine. That'd be good. You know, we, we can always do that. So you have to be very permissive about verifying in whatever ways things can be verified. Um, but until you have a really strong set of influential voices who seem to be getting the why and are willing to articulate that why to other people, it's going to be very hard to establish the season of study. Because at the end, you'll go through all of this, and people will be maybe excited about some options and ready to go further, and somebody says, we don't need this. And if there aren't influencers in the room to say, wait a minute, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, it's not fun to look at, but this is where we're at. So that's really the, that communicating the why, and it can't just be the minister, it can't just be the council chair. Um, you really need it, uh, even if it's an unlikely team of people <laughs> who may not work all that well with each other, you need a collection of people who, who uh, get that message and are willing to communicate it. Yes? It, it sounds like the why you're talking about is running out of money. And that's not quite enough why for me. Okay. Well, no, there, there's more than one why. I, I was just, for some congregations, it's very f hard for them to look at this unless there's a very concrete consequence to, to galvanize uh, attention to it. But I agree with you, it, it's not all about the money. What would be another um, compelling why that you would pose? What I want to, to work on is the why and what it is we're seeing in that conversation about what the church is. And you talked about it as well about the gospel message, the, the love that we have and the world uh, needs. So what is it that, that uh, is at the heart of what we're here for that we want to carry forward, but we need another vessel to carry, a different vessel to carry it forward uh, at this time in our history? No, that, that sounds absolutely right to me. 
And then the, 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 that second step is really one of the most difficult. So but if, if you work your way through that, and that'll take time. Um, establishing then steps in a timeline for a study and deliberation phase and um, working with, say, a, a council um, or other governing group, um, they may just rubber stamp it because they're used to doing that sort of thing, but they need to understand that they're going to get some resistance probably, and that there's probably going at some point to be a push to X something out immediately or to include, you know, to, to focus on something as the only option. And in, in adopting this, they need to know that they have a role in protecting the frame, protecting the process, and that they need to refuse to entertain. Now, I don't know how, how that works out bylaws wise, I'm not going to get into, but they need to have courage as leaders to say, we adopted this frame and we're going to be faithful to it. Um, that, that's the, the, the most helpful way to proceed. And then conducting a season of study using whatever resources are going to be best for your congregation, ideally including all the options you can think of. Um, and then after the study period, a period of actual then dialogue and deliber deliberation in which you feed back the pros and cons that people have identified, the feelings people have reported about these different options, and where there's some steps of deliberation um, for um, it, you know, at least narrowing down the options, uh, that's probably going to be the first step, and then perhaps eventually getting to a decision. Yes? I just have a question about the influencers for why, and I'm wondering how do you have, without seeming like, how do you keep that in a way non-biased and this information sharing rather than this is what we're doing and here are the people that are going to tell you that we're doing it? Keep that so that the dialogue is fair with everybody. So it's really a question about the openness of the process yeah. and transparency, um, yeah. transparency and maybe starting with what might seem like a cadre um, instead of a fully well, open. Well, there's, there's a lot of power in that when you're choosing who's going to communicate the why. Mm -hmm. Well, and one way to um, navigate that is to do a lot of it is as one-on-ones. Um, particularly if you're anticipating that that dynamic is going to hinder people's understanding and trust of the process. But um, uh, their power needs to be respected to the extent that they're not taken by surprise. And that's the balancing to the, we all do this together, value. But you're much better off knowing what they object to and not bringing it to the larger conversation until there has been some chance for them to work it through, to come back with maybe other information, to uh, you know, explore ways to um, have them at least not ready to stop it. Um, so, you know, there's kind of a balance between, um, and, and this is actually a struggle for me as an idealist, and it's been very helpful for me to be involved in, in the community, community organizing, and working with professional organizers, uh, who in many cases, in, their job is to help me be realistic about power, <laughs> which is not my natural place. Um, and so I tend to make a lot of political mistakes. Uh, that's not good for the congregation, for leaders to be making a lot of political mistakes. And political mistakes means you misjudged the influence and power dynamics of the congregation. And you, you don't have to like it, but you have to respect it, uh, is the hard-won learning that goes with that. So and, uh, in, the, in the deliberation process, uh, you, know, you should use the best of the practices that you know um, within your polity, within your region, um, uh, there's you know, a, a host of opportunities there. And then always throughout, continuing to manage the pressures to short circuit the process. And you know, in the end, you might not succeed. 
And in that case, you say, okay, in this situation, that wasn't possible, but you can do everything you can think of um, to have it sustained to the end and to hold fast um, if the congregation will permit you to do that. <coughs> Remembering in the end, there's always what part of no didn't you understand, you know? <laughs> kind of, kind of. All right. Um, so. That's the longer version of that that's in your handout. And that is the end of this particular segment.